Hey everyone, welcome back to Blueprint Nursing NCLEX Reviews. My name is Nicole and we're going to do a practice NCLEX case study and use our maternal nursing knowledge. Case studies can seem a bit intimidating, but we're going to go bit by bit and get our nursing brains ready for the NCLEX. Let's set the scene. You're a nurse in labor and delivery and you're caring for a 28 year old client that has just come in. Luckily, we have our nurse's notes. Let's take a look. The, at 1300, the client presented to the labor and delivery unit reporting contractions that started to become painful at 0900 and a gush of fluid at 1130. So thinking spontaneous rupture of membranes there. The client also reported feeling something in their vagina. The client now reports that their contractions are every five minutes and rate them a seven out of 10 for pain. The client's GTPAL, if you remember that's gravida, term pregnancy, abortion, and living children is 32011. The client's estimated due date places them at 37 weeks gestation. The client has a history of polyhydramnios and gestational diabetes. A lot to go through here, but no worries. You've got this. Does anything stick out to you yet? I'm going to be keeping their history of polyhydramnios and spontaneous rupture of membranes in mind. Let's move to the vital signs. Their temperature is 98.7 degrees, pulse is 95 beats per minute, respirations are 20 breaths per minute, their blood pressure is 138 over 84, and their pulse oxygen is 98% on room air. Are we seeing anything that sticks out as abnormal? Maybe their blood pressure is reading slightly high, but what may cause a slightly elevated blood pressure? Yeah, labor pain. To assess our labor client, let's look at the assessment tab. In labor and delivery, we assess fetal well-being and uterine activity, which we can see right under this assessment tab. Let's take it step by step. The fetal heart rate baseline is 100 beats per minute. What does this mean to you? Fetal bradycardia, yeah. Any baseline heart rate less than 110 beats per minute is classified as fetal bradycardia. Are there accelerations present? No. Do we remember what accelerations are? They are abrupt increases in heart rate by at least 15 beats per minute that return to the baseline after at least 15 seconds. The presence of accelerations are a reassuring sign of fetal well-being and oxygenation. Are there decelerations present? Yeah, there are recurrent variable decelerations present. The lowest point or the nadir of the decelerations is 70 beats per minute. This one has a little bit more to break down, but we got this. Okay, decelerations are the gradual or abrupt decrease in heart rate that may or may not return to baseline. Recurrent decelerations mean that they're repetitive in nature. This may clue us into something being abnormal. Variable decelerations are abrupt decelerations that look like a V, U, or W on our field monitor. They're indicative of umbilical cord compression a mnemonic to remember some components of fetal heart rate tracings would be veal chop. V, variable deceleration. C would be cord compression. And then we go through the rest of the letters, which would be E, early deceleration. H, head compression. A, accelerations. O, okay. L, late decelerations. P, placental insufficiency. Lastly, the lowest point that the variable decelerations reach is 70 beats per minute, which gives us an idea of blood flow to the baby during the deceleration. Variability is noted to be normal. What do we know about variable variability? Well, it is the fluctuation of fetal heart rate within six to 20 beats per minute, which is known as moderate variability. Minimal variability, which is what we're seeing, is the fluctuation in fetal heart rate less than or equal to five beats per minute. It can be indicative of a sleep cycle or it could be an underlying issue. Now let's dive to the last part of the assessment, which is the contraction pattern. Contraction monitoring is showing a regular contraction pattern with contractions every five minutes lasting 60 to 80 seconds. From this picture, we can note that the contractions are regularly occurring. The time from the start of one uterine contraction to the next is five minutes on average, and the duration of the contraction is lasting between 60 to 80 seconds. There's no mention of uterine stress or tachycystole, um, too many contractions. 
So it's likely that the client is in the first stage of labor, which lasts from the start of contractions to full dilation of the cervix. How are we feeling about the assessment? Something is occurring. Let's dig deeper. All right, we have our first question. Which of the following client findings requires immediate follow-up? And we're noticing the immediate in bold and that is a select all that apply. All right, client's history of gestational diabetes, fetal heart rate baseline at 100 beats per minute, gestational age of 37 weeks, pain rating of seven out of 10, recurrent variable decelerations, and report of feeling something in their vagina. Take a moment to pause here and uh, go ahead and answer the question and come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's go through each of these questions step by step and see what you got. First up, we have client's history of gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is an important piece of information, but it is something that is not worrisome if the client is not experiencing symptoms of hyper or hypoglycemia. Fetal heart rate baseline at 100 beats per minute. Yeah, what are we seeing here? Fetal bradycardia. We want to address that immediately. Gestational age of 37 weeks. 37 weeks would not be concerning because this is the age that is considered to be a full-term pregnancy. Pain rating of 7 out of 10. While the client is rating their pain fairly high, uh, this isn't totally abnormal for labor. Recurrent variable decelerations. Variable decelerations that are recurring are definitely a reason for immediate follow-up. We're seeing a consistent interruption in umbilical uh, cord blood flow to the baby. All right, last one, reporting a uh, feeling of something in their vagina. This one seems kind of odd, right? We don't really expect a uh, labor inclined to feel something in their vagina, and maybe not until birth at least, right? But with the other two options, this could be a symptom of something emergent. Any ideas of what it is? Let's continue. Okay, for this next question, we're going to analyze our client findings to see if we can identify the emergent issue that our client is experiencing. And do you notice that it is one of the new next-gen NCLEX items? Love it. For each assessment finding, uh, we're going to click to specify whether the finding is consistent with cord prolapse, a condition in which the umbilical cord slips past the baby's head after rupture of membranes, Placental abruption, a condition in which the placenta prematurely separates from the uterine wall, and uterine rupture, the complete separation of the uterine muscles. Each finding may support more than one disease process. Pause the video here if you'd like to take a moment to look through the table and select your answers. Since this one is a table, let's fill it out together and discuss. Okay, let's go through the findings. We have the client's report of feeling something in their vagina. What are we thinking here? Just cord prolapse. The client may feel the umbilical cord in their vagina since the cord has prolapsed or slipped past the baby's head. This would be absent in placental abruption and uterine rupture. Then we have fetal heart rate changes. What changes do you remember seeing? Bradycardia, variable decelerations, minimal variability. Yeah, all of those. Well, all three of these conditions could have fetal heart rate changes due to decreased blood flow to the baby. Let's keep going. History of polyhydramnios. Do you remember that? what that means? Yeah, too much amniotic fluid. Baby has a little too much space, which means a greater risk for the cord to slip on by. Another more, uh, mark for cord prolapse here. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Probably, but let's keep going. Painful contractions. Well, this one can be found with like with any of these conditions. Um, so we'll mark all three here. Vaginal bleeding. Our client didn't report this according to our notes, but would this potentially be found with any of these conditions? Yeah, probably just uh, placental abruption and uterine rupture. Looks like we have a likely condition, don't we? Cord prolapse. Hope you have your running shoes on and ready to act quickly. 
Now that we have an idea of what's going on, let's act fast and move to question three. The highest priority to the fetus at this time, and we're noting the word highest bolded, is anemia, hypoxia, jaundice, nuchal cord, shoulder dystocia. Pause the video here and jump back in when you're ready. I'll be here. What'd you get? I'll give you a quick hint what I got. If it is cord prolapse, blood flow is interrupted. Hypoxia. With interrupted blood flow to the baby, we will expect to see fetal hypoxia. Fetal circulation heavily relies on oxygen-rich blood from the client. Frequent cord compression means decreased blood flow to the baby. This is why fetal heart rate changes are evident on assessment too. Let's talk about the other options really quickly. Anemia. Although there would be interrupted blood flow to the baby with a, spe a suspected cord prolapse, anemia would not be a higher risk than hypoxia here. Jaundice. There are many risk factors for newborn jaundice ranging from traumatic births to assigned gender. Jaundice wouldn't be a higher risk factor than a hypoxia. Nuchal cord. Nuchal cord is when the umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. Nuchal cords may not be seen with cord prolapses since the umbilical cord has slipped past the baby's head. While umbilical cords can be long, it's not noted here, so this would not be the highest risk to the baby. Shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocias are when the baby's head is born, but the shoulders are unable to pass through the client's pelvis. It is not evident that this would be the highest risk to the fetus with a suspected cord prolapse. So as you notice, there are a lot of actions that are being taken before a confirmed condition. This case study is a great example of um, how you're going to be taking information and prioritizing hypotheses and actions for your clients when you're real deal nurses. We're at question number four after suspecting that this client has a prolapsed cord. Let's get to the question. Based on the client's findings, which of these following actions should the nurse prioritize, noting the word prioritize? Administer high flow oxygen, intrauterine resuscitation, IV fluid bolus, turn the client on their side, vaginal examination. Okay, take a second to pause here and we'll catch up in a bit. Well, a lot of these seem like important and impactful actions to take, but there is one that will be the best option for multiple reasons. What did you come up with? If you said vaginal examination, great. If not, let's talk it through. Administering high flow oxygen and IV fluid bolus are both great actions that can help deliver oxygen and blood flow to the baby. They are important actions, but remember, we're looking for most important action here. Intrauterine resuscitation typically involves the administration of fluids through a catheter that is placed in the uterus through the cervix to increase the amount of fluid or cushion the fetus and fetal parts have around them. This intervention would be contraindicated with a suspected cord prolapse. Turning the client on their side would not be an appropriate measure uh, for a client with cord prolapse because we want to place the client in a position that relieves pressure on the cord. Think knee to chest. Do you notice why these options are not the priority action? Well, based on the client's findings, feeling something in their vagina, fetal heart rate changes, history polyhydramnios, suspected rupture of membranes, the nurse should suspect a cord prolapse. Cord prolapse requires vaginal examination to assess for dilation, effacement, station, and presence of the umbilical cord. As with anything, we need to assess our uh, client before any actions. We wouldn't want to start chest compressions on someone before assessing them, right? Right. Okay, we've assessed our client. Time for our next nursing note. 1310, the nurse performs a sterile vaginal examination and palpates the umbilical cord below the head of the baby. The client is five centimeters dilated, 70% effaced, and zero station. All right, we have an emergent situation on our hands, literally. Let's take action. This next question is another new item format from the next gen and Clex. It is meant to mimic the drop down item, but since we're doing it together, it's formatted slightly differently. Ready to get started? The nurse has palpated a prolapsed cord. They apply pressure to the presenting fetal part and call for assistance, but now must decide their next actions. 
complete the following sentences from a list of options. Okay, take a moment to uh, read through the sentences and come back when you're ready. So I know these situations are hard to dissect because so many things are happening near simultaneously, but we will slow it down here and go through our actions one by one. Assistance arrives and the nurse's next action is to blink. Place the client in Trendelenburg position. We remember that Trendelenburg is where the client is supine and the bed is angled so that their head is below the level of their heart. Why is this the next intervention? Because it further reduces pressure from the umbilical cord during this emergency. It is all about making sure that cord is minimally compressed as possible. All right, next up. Their next action to delegate to another nurse is to administer high flow oxygen and initiate IV bolus per protocol. Okay, so again, lots going on here. Why are we administering high flow oxygen to a client when they have good oxygen saturation on room air? Well, this is where we remember that in labor and delivery, we have two clients. The purpose of administering high flow oxygen is to get as much oxygen to the baby as possible. This is also why starting an IV bolus is the next step. Then the nurse explains what is happening to the client and that the plan of care is to prepare for cesarean section. It is very important that we inform our clients of interventions even in cases of emergency. This client is heading for a cesarean section because of their prolapse cord and cervical dilation. So the correct choice after explaining a plan of care is to prepare the client for a cesarean section. But why didn't we choose to obtain informed consent? Well, this would definitely happen in real life by the provider who would be performing the cesarean section. We would witness this as the primary nurse. Ready for the last question? I sure am. Okay, let's read this nurse's note. 1350, the client is in recovery after an emergent cesarean section. The infant is being followed by the nursery nurse. We made it. We recognized the client's condition and acted quickly, but our job isn't done yet. As a nurse of a client who is recovering from a cesarean section, which of the following interventions would be prioritized in the immediate postpartum period? Noting the word prioritized here. Administering pain medication, applying sequential compression devices, assessing urinary output, monitoring vital signs, performing a fundal assessment. Okay, I'll give you a moment to pause here and come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's finish this case up. What do you think it is? Assessing vital signs. Assessing vital signs will be the priority nursing intervention for our clients recovering from a cesarean section. Something so simple that we've learned in fundamentals can be so life-saving. Our client has had a huge hemodynamics shift with the delivery of their infant and had a, a surgical procedure. Vital signs can reveal early signs of hemorrhage or malignant hyperthermia. Let's review the other options. Administering pain medication is definitely going to be a key intervention in postpartum healing, but would not indicate any hemodynamic trends in the client's recovery. Applying sequential compression devices are important in preventing what common post-op complication. Blood clot, yeah, but this wouldn't be prioritized over post-op, um, frequent post-op vital signs. Assessing a urinary output. This is an excellent um, intervention for monitoring fluid balances, but it would not show any immediate changes in the client's post-op condition. Lastly, performing a fundal assessment. This is a close second to vital signs. Do you remember what a fundal assessment is? It's the palpation of the client's uterus after surgery. We assess the fundus, which is the top of your uterus, um, for the fundal height, its location, left, right, or midline, and tone, firm or boggy, which is soft. It can tell us if a client is recovering as expected or if they may be hemorrhaging due to poor uterine tone. However, as with the other interventions, it would not be prioritized over the frequent assessment of vital signs in the post-cesarean section period. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for taking this case study journey with me. Uh, remember that if you got anything wrong, it's okay. Really, it is. This is all just practice and learning, which is what we do even after we're passing the NCLEX. Can't wait to see you guys soon.